folks. It's my pleasure to be here just like it is every week as the host of the Rec Poker Podcast. I've got the best freaking job in the world, so I get to hang out here on Monday nights and talk to my poker friends about this game that we love so much. Uh, my name is Jim Reed. I'm at Rec Poker Jim on Twitter and uh, just Jim in the Rec Poker home games uh, or uh, in the Rec-, Rec Poker website and uh, Bluff Storini in the home game. So come and steal my chips uh, 10 to 11 times a week in the home game series run by John Somsky. Uh, I love being a part of Rec Poker. I'm so glad I joined as a premium member back in 2019. Uh, most of what we do here at Rec Poker is free, so I have to thank our sponsors, the Running Aces Hotel, Racetrack, and Casino, who we will be visiting on October 4th and on August 4th and 5th. Everything's going great tonight, guys. We're doing really well on every front. Um, that's going to be super fun. Rec Poker weekend at Running Aces. I can't wait to go uh, meet some old friends and uh, meet, make some new friends at the same time. But this is the forums edition of the podcast, uh, which means I'm joined here by the Wrecking Crew. And if you want to find out more about me or the other members of the Wrecking Crew, you can go to rec.poker slash crew. But just listen up because you're going to meet a few of them on the air right here, right now. Well, I'm Chris Jones. You can find me 5v5 on threads or 5 by 5 in the Poker Stars home game. My name is Joe Kulis, and you can find me still on Twitter at Joe Cool PhD, Cool with a K, or Elvita11 in the home game. And I am John Somsky, and I am Poker Geek MN everywhere. And I'm Rob Washam, and I'm Rabman50 everywhere, including threads and Twitter and wherever. <laughs> <laughs> the great migration has begun we'll see we'll see I'm, I'm also i started the new threads account but um i'm gonna hold off on spending any time there until twitter until twitter like officially crashes and burns it's a it's a burning hellscape right now but until it's like actually post-apocalyptic mutants roaming uh the land that kind of thing i'm gonna stick it out and see if we can pull one out um okay well thanks everybody thanks for joining me here tonight uh, this is the forums edition of the podcast, like I was saying. It's the very first live on YouTube forums edition of the podcast. I see we've got Charles Allen, among a few others in the YouTube chat, Evil Roy Slade, uh, our man Dave in there, um, and a couple others I can tell. Uh, so if folks are just listening, we're doing our very first forums edition on YouTube. We're going to follow this up with the chats edition a little later on tonight. Um, but this is going to be fun. If you've got any questions about what's coming up, then uh, feel free to uh, type away. We are going to be looking at a post in the Rec Poker forums. They're free, by the way, along with so much of the other great stuff we do around here. This is one by Outfocus Metal. Outfocus Metal is a user here at Rec Poker. He has uh, 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 typed in our forums before, and uh, I think we'll be hearing more from this player. The question that Outfocus Metal is posting is, What's the best way to practice GTO? And they say, I'm looking to practice pure GTO with no exploitative play, but I'm really struggling at lower levels where the exploits are so obvious. While that's not bad per se, it's difficult for me to differentiate between good GTO deviation and me just reverting back to my old non-GTO based style of play. Um, he gives an example here and says, my, my local pub game is the cheapest MTT available. So I go along and promise myself I'll stick to GTO regardless of opponent or action. Then Old Man Coffee calls the preflop raise for the ninth hand in a row. And as I know, he will 100% bet when he hits and 100% call when he's chasing a draw. I raise with absolutely everything regardless of our ranges. I can't stop myself doing it. So is it better to avoid these low stake games if I could afford to lose um, a wedge of cash practicing at higher levels? So not a bankroll, but a practice fund. Or am I missing the difficulties at those higher levels um, as well? Uh, and then they conclude their post by saying, also interested to hear if people think I should never be trying to play pure GTO live and instead sign up for practice tools like DTO for that. So we did get some excellent um, responses here in the Rec Poker forums um, from Chris Jones, um, from Rob Washam, uh, Outfocus Metal responds a couple times. We're going to get into those. I think... Uh, the one thing that jumped out at me from this post, which is a pretty common mistake or a common, uh, no, I think it's a mistake that players make as they're getting more into GTO and they're learning about it and they're getting excited about it and kind of seduced by it. Um, they want to go and apply it in all these places where I don't think its application is really warranted. And the problem is, and I think Outfocus Metal kind of knows this from the way that they're describing their post. The players at those low stakes, at those entry tournaments that you're playing, 
they're just making so many mistakes that you don't need to be playing defense. And GTO is basically about playing defense. It's about being unexploitable yourself. Um, at this level, you're going to be much better off just taking advantage of the mistakes that your opponents make. And if you play GTO, you're sort of like bringing a very fancy uh, tool to a knife fight. And you're just going to get stabbed repeatedly by these people with these very simple tools that are much better at stabbing than your fancy tool. I, that's a butchered way. I, I, shouldn't even, I shouldn't even have started first. Okay, Chris, you, you put a really good post up here. I've set the table by sounding terrible. So anything that you come up with now is going to be amazing. Why don't you dazzle our audience with some actually well-crafted uh, words in response to this post? Set, setting the table with knives. That yeah. you're... Hey, <laughs> see, hey. There, at least there was like a narrative theme throughout it. I've, I have lots of fancy tools that I bring to any knife fight. I think that's, uh, that's, <laughs> that's the, that's the, the lesson learned here. Let's just bring some fancy tools to Fancier any kind tools. of knife A gun fight. is not, not... pretty good in a knife fight. <laughs> that's true. That's pretty fancy. That's pretty fancy. I suppose that is pretty fancy. Some, some, <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, so I think, you know, one of the things to, that I just immediately would respond to this is um, we learn GTO for a variety of reasons. And I, and I think there's this sort of misunderstanding that like what we're learning is how to play. But what we're learning is what is the what is the baseline? at which we are starting our approach to play. And then how are we going to make adjustments based on the assumption, the correct assumption in most sense, unless we're playing against like Ollie and Servich doing some RTAing, is that <laughs> humans are not going to play perfectly. And so we're going to make adjustments to that. But if we can, as you know, even approximate what some of the best approaches would be as a baseline. Now we know like, okay, if my pro opponent is completely balanced, right? I'm going to open down to, I'm just making something up just randomly. Like I'm opening up down to pocket sixes and Jack 10 suited and uh King queen offsuit, right? That's what I'm, I'm going to do if they're perfectly balanced. But now I know that, well, my opponent, or I'm learning maybe that my opponent isn't perfectly balanced and maybe they're going to be way, 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 way too wide um, and be kind of erratic. Well, now I maybe can open up a little bit wider or now I know that they're a total rock and they're only going to play like Queens plus. Well, now I'm going to take that that range that I know kind of intuitively goes down to pocket sixes and goes to jack-10 suited and king-queen offsuit. And I'm going to say, well, jack-10 suited is out. So are poxes sixes and on up the, the chain because that my opponent's only coming back at me with a much tighter range. So there's like there's ways that this helps us when we say things like, oh, now I need to tighten up against this opponent. We might not even know what that means unless we understand GTO, right? But it's not that we're actually taking this and playing it out in the wild, especially as our correspondent talks about in a bar league where we've got an, a, a, like a player that we have a perfect exploit against and we know exactly what they're doing every time they raise, every time they call. Well, let's keep playing that exploit because we know, <laughs> I mean, there is zero reason to play them GTO. So I think when we want to practice GTO, that's where these tools that the correspondent mentions are are great. Like DTO, GTO wizard, these kind of things we can just play them in the lab, we can kind of learn as we're going and that helps us understand how we're going to approach and make adjustments against players, but it's not going to be how we play. That's how I'd start. Yeah, and I think um anyone else of course jump in, but as uh as Chris is saying, if, he, if we know our opponents are going to make certain errors, like let's say our opponent only ever uh, three bets with pocket aces, then we don't need to have a four betting strategy that involves a polarized range or a linear range. Um, we, we can just play it. We, we can play fully exploitatively. We don't have to worry about balance. We don't have to worry about uh, is our opponent going to find our play predictable and when you don't need to worry about that kind of stuff, GTO uh, is just, it just tells you where to start from. And then you decide where to deviate uh, from there. Rob, you unmuted first. Then I think Joe had something else you wanted to add. 
Yeah, I think um, um, I agree with everything that we've said so far. Um, we're now currently studying GTO Poker Simplified by Dara Carney with uh, Barry Carter in our book study. And one of the things that Dara is professing is that by using a GTO strategy at even at the micro stakes levels, it allows you to um, move up in stakes and be able to continue to um, improve and continue to, to not be exploited at the next level. What he's saying is um, what you're doing is you're creating this unexploitable version of your poker strategy that um, you don't have to worry what happens when you go up to the next level. Because as they say, at each level, there are different exploits that are will it help you make more money. And that's very true. But if you concentrate on the level you're on today and you get all the exploits down and now your strategy is full of all those exploits, then you go up to the next level, you have to start all over again because you, the exploits are going to be different at the next level as you increase. So what he's professing is that you get that basic GTO strategy that is unexploitable by your opponents and work on it and work on it and then move up in the stakes accordingly. You're going to have an easier time at each level that you advance. Joe, did you have something there? Yeah, I just think that when you look at GTO strategy, right? I mean, that's an enormous concept. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes uh, in the same way that we can't really understand variance very well, we can't really understand the enormity of, of what a GTO strategy would look like and play. So I think that in addition to what, what everything else has been said is like you have to plan when you're saying I'm going to start implementing a GTO strategy, you really have to start breaking it down to sections and groups and say, well, this, this is what I do. This is how, this is what I'm going to work at on that time. And <clears throat> you're going to find that as you practice something, regardless of where you are, as you go back to your regular game, your performance is going to slip and you have to just kind of accept that that's going to be the case in those particular areas because you start thinking harder about what things are going on. And, and it's much easier to play a simplified strategy uh, because you can apply that consistently and always have a good idea. Whereas if you're in an online environment, you got 30 seconds to make a decision, which means you're essentially... <laughs> So I'm going to go and talk about some brain things here and, and or it's, it's going to be actually accurate. But but <laughs> when you're thinking about when you're thinking about how the brain utilizes information, uh, I may have said this before, you want less of your brain to be involved when you're doing tasks efficiently and well, because you're, you're allocating less resources. There's less thinking and, and, and uh, essentially higher level processing that's going on and it becomes almost automatic. So even athletes will talk about this when you when you do fmri scans um these scans that show functional activities in brains they calm down when they're doing an activity that we do well because they, they can allocate resources differently for that strategy and they've kind of made it automatic you're now going to step away from that if you're playing well and make your strategy more difficult use more of your brain allocate more of your resources have more uncertainty which is going to make you more inefficient in terms of doing that task and make more mistakes so you really have to go into any of these uh, self improvements to say all right i'm going to i'm going to play worse for a while and that's okay but i'm going to play worse in this very specific area because i don't want it to be brought across to my entire game so say you're working on you know, middle and pocket pairs well, I'm going to play my middle pocket pairs worse and I'm going to lose some EV with them. But other aspects of my range or other aspects of my strategy, I'm going to stick to the same progress because then I can make money and support my uh, bankroll during the time when um, I am losing money within other parts of my range. And that way you don't feel quite like it's a disaster every time you try to implement GTO and, and it falls apart and you lose every last dime that you won over the last month because you tried to get better yeah i think that's a great point and i think that is very common for people um at, you know that's why my dad who, who was a golfer would often say like don't practice on the course practice on the range and then go just play when you're out there to play just play let your brain take care of itself and um it's common when you're trying new things 
for that to affect your results because you're going to be less comfortable. You're going to be less confident, less sure about things. You're going to feel like you might be you're making mistakes. Um, so don't let that get you down either. I think that's, that's very natural. Rob? Um, we we also talked a little bit about some of the um, apps out there that we can use to practice GTO, right? Like DTO, APT, um, GTO Wizard, those types of things. And those are really great. Um, but if you don't have a basic understanding of what GTO is to begin with, just jumping in and doing those drills is not going to teach you much. It's just going to sh- tell you when you're wrong or when you're right, but it's not going to tell you why you're mm-hmm. wrong or that you're right. So I think before you start actively using those types of training tools to get a, a basic understanding of what GTO means and how it works in poker. And I think, and, and that's um, where I'll, I'll make one more comment here about Outfocus Metal and their, and their response. And unless there's anything else, we'll probably uh, wrap it up uh, for this episode. Um, so Outfocus Metal responds. So yeah, there's some great responses here. And I do encourage our listeners, it, it's free. Go, go. I'm, I'll put the link to this uh, forum post in the show notes. You don't even need a free Rec Poker account to view the forum post. You can just click on the link and view it for free as a visitor. <laughs> But I would encourage our folks, come get a free Rec Poker account. All it takes is an email address and a smile, and you can respond to posts. You can post yourself. You can um, take advantage of a lot of the great stuff that we do here for free, like the Home Game Club, the Discord channel, um, uh, our Twitch channel, the YouTube stuff. It's all it's uh, so much free stuff here. Um, and the forums are really something that our members tell us. That's where they made some steps is in, in their own poker journey by sharing these spots with other people. So to wrap things up for Outfocus Metal here, In response to some of these posts, uh, responses, they say, I'm not trying to practice GTO or play GTO per se. I'm trying to embed the GTO principles in my play by practicing. And I want to do that in the live play as my game is so different live than when I'm playing online. And I think that's like, that's the right attitude out focus metal. But I want to encourage you. I don't think any of us should be embedding the GTO principles in our play. I think we should be embedding the GTO principles in our overall strategy that we then, every time we walk to a table, we then make us a, a, a more specific strategy, a more uh, tailored strategy for the people that we're going to be playing against. And knowing where to start from, like GTO tells you how to extract every possible scent of ev out of every hand on the grid and it does it in a way that's as balanced as possible and as uh, unexploitable as possible but again like we've sort of been saying throughout this episode that's not a practical strategy in the games that we're playing so using it as the foundation from which we deviate is a great way to do it and i would say embed those gto principles in your theory but not in your play. And then just think about how to deviate from it to, to take advantage of the errors that the people at your game are playing. And Joe? Yeah, and, and so I have an example of, if we still have time, if not, I can- Yes, no, we do, know, please. Yeah. So, and it just happened recently in terms of how I use it. So I use GTO Wizard and I had a spot in a 50 NL uh, cash game that I was playing where I had tens. Uh, and um, uh, somebody that had been three betting me at the table, uh, repeatedly from the small blind. And so I decided to four bet. Um, and then on the river, I do three quarter bet and he jams. All right. Mm. And I'm like, Oh, what do I do? So I decided to call and, uh, he had a set of sevens and luckily I got, I nailed the river. My 10 came in and I was like, Hey, you know, look at me. And then I'm like, no, is that <laughs> the question is, is that lucky or was it a good play? And I thought this terrible play, right? This guy, he jams, he's got a set or better, at least two pair and I'm beat or better over pair for that matter. Um, and uh, when I looked at GTO Wizard, the only thing that it actually complained about was that my uh, flop bet was too big. And I thought that was very interesting. Um, and so I decided I was going to utilize that and see how it would work. And then in the home game yesterday, I, had, I got tens uh, and I was like, fantastic. And then this individual whose name is, uh, I'm going to I'm going to make it anonymous so nobody knows who it is, but uh, San Momsky from Utah. (laughs) (laughs) 
check three bet me. And I said, I know the exact play to go. And so I four bet him. And, or no, so I called. And then, which was what uh, the GTO said I was supposed to do. And then I, then I came and I had an over pair. And I said, okay, I can bet here. I know the exact amount to bet. And then that person jammed. <laughs> and I said, I know I'm supposed to call. And he took over a set of eights and I didn't, I didn't win. <laughs> so now why am I telling this besides the funny thing that John put me out of the tournament yesterday is that it showed me exactly what the unexploitable play is, right? Because GTO shows you that in a, in a, against a perfect opponent, they could have enough unpaired hands that the four bet is okay at a frequency. And, um, by always calling, you always eliminate the fact that you have aces in your range. So it tells you something about how to play. But in both instances, I was playing against players who are not perfect. John's nearly perfect, but not very quite close. perfect. Right. Yeah, very quite close. close. And as a result, facing a jam, I don't care what GTO says anymore. It's a fold. It's a fold. It's a fold. It's a fold. If I only have an overpair, because I'm probably facing something that's going to beat me. And I think that's to me conceptualized uh, in this hand. Like how to use it, how to how to determine what GTO is, why it's making those decisions, but also why you don't want to listen to it sometimes because you you got to get lucky on the river then. Yeah, John. Yeah. So uh, sorry about that. I got lucky and. <laughs> Flop the set there. Yeah, it um, sounds like you got the chips in good, John. I, I wouldn't. Yeah. I wouldn't take anything away from that. But so I think it's important to understand that GTO is not about saying what is the best play in this spot. What it is, what it is, is it's about creating a range of plays, a range of hands, a range of raises that leave you to be un exploitable so it doesn't matter what hand mom jomsky had in that <laughs> for or some jump whatever so it was. Momsky, yeah <laughs> whatever uh it doesn't matter what they had in that particular hand you cannot be exploited now it may not be the ideal hand given the way i I'm sure there's a more exploitable way of playing against me but gto is all about leaving yourself unexploitable when you learn that then you can figure out where to deviate from that based upon the errors that your players other players are making and i know i make a ton of them so <laughs> joe could have done better by not playing gto against me yeah yeah joe I was going to say you, you played that one pretty darn well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got the max. You got the max. <laughs> you jammed on all in, well, and you got yeah. me to call right in the back end. <laughs> well, I, I'm not going to complain about that. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and hey, flopping sets—that is a Blusterini-approved method of profiting in the world of poker. So for some of us, it's all we have. That's all I'm saying. You know, take go go get that cheddar, John. Um, so yeah, Rob. I was just going to say there's one other concept that we haven't discussed here that I think is very important when we talk about GTO. And that is that GTO is a strategy that informs you how to play all the hands in your range. Yes. So that when you do have value, you get paid. If the only Great time point. you raise or go all in is you have pocket aces, everybody's going to fold and you're never going to get paid. So you need to have a balanced range of different hands that you show up with. So when, when people see that, they understand that just because you bet doesn't mean you always have it. But you're going to have it enough between your value and your bluffs that you're going to get paid when you have value. And that's how you make money in poker. Yep. I love it. Um, re regular listeners will know that's been something that Rob's been on about uh, for the last while, talking about how the value bets drive our poker strategy. And I just love this point that uh, John's make that uh, Joe uh, made here as well that uh, Rob was picking up on. That GTO is really trying to create a solution for every possible hand and every possible decision point that that hand can go through. All the different flops it can see, all the different sizes available. And it's sort of like in the big picture, here's how you could play poker and you would be very hard to play against. Um, so if you're playing against some other GTO bots, defense like that is really important. If you're not, 
the way to win at poker is by your you know letting your mis- letting your opponents make bigger mistakes than you or more mistakes than you and trust me none no one's out there playing gto so you're it's a good place to start from but um you're going to make your money by capitalizing on the mistakes of your opponents and if you're and if you say but jim i'm playing in a game where no one makes any mistakes well then you are making a big mistake by playing in that game sir or madam and uh you should find a different poker game to play if if winning is important to you um because mostly you want to play with players that are about your level or a little worse players that are going to make worse mistakes than you or bigger mistakes than you that's how we uh make money um and i am always available so you know look me up put, send up the blusterini signal and i'll come i'll come join your game easy money available all right well folks uh i think that about wraps it up for this forums edition of the rec poker podcast i'd like to thank uh rob washam john somsky joe coolis and chris jones and out focus metal for that post of course i want to thank the uh running aces hotel racetrack and casino and casino we'll see you soon and you the listeners thank you so much so stick around for the chat edition next and we'll see you next week all right good night everybody